how to forgive someone who has hurt you. It's not easy to forgive. It's not easy to forgive a parent who abandoned you as a child without caring how you're going to grow or to go to school. It's not easy to forgive an ex who assaulted you, left you on a hospital bed without caring how you're going to start your life again. It's not easy to forgive a partner who is cheating on you and you caught them on your matrimonial bed. It's not easy to forgive a sibling who squandered your father's inheritance, grabbed everything without caring about the rest of you. It is not easy to forgive a boss who summarily dismissed you because you couldn't sleep with them or do them some other favor. It's not easy to forgive a cop who pressed false charges on you or your loved one, and either you or your loved one had to serve a jail term and ferry. It's not easy to forgive a runaway motorist who knocked dead your loved one. It's not easy to forgive an errant gunman who fatally wounded someone who is so dear to you. Forgiveness is not easy, but lack of forgiveness is more costly. Failure to forgive is to live in the past. A life lived without forgiveness is a life lived in the past. Forgiveness does not in any way change your past, but it opens up your tomorrow. It opens up your future. When you don't forgive someone, you empower them to deflate your energy today, to deny your joy today, and possibly rob your future and your destiny. When you forgive, You free yourself from your self-imposed prison. Forgiveness is letting go resentment, anger, bitterness, choosing not to take offense. You must understand in this life, you will be offended from time to time. You will be offended again and again. What will be your attitude towards offense? That's the subject of our discussion today. And I want us to examine five pertinent questions on this momentous subject. Number one, why should I forgive? Two, how do I forgive someone who is not sorry? Three, how many times should I forgive? Four, how do I know I have forgiven? Five, must I reconcile? When I forgive. Question one. Why should I forgive? Answer. You are a product of forgiveness. In Matthew 6 12, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus asked us to pray like this every day, every day, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Jesus tied our own forgiveness to our ability to forgive others. In other words, our own forgiveness is predicated on our capacity and willingness to forgive others. He called it debts. When somebody has offended you, they owe you, just like you owe God. You owe God because you have sinned from time to time. Jesus' father said something very amazing. When I look at the Lord's Prayer, what surprises me is that Jesus singled out only one element for emphasis. He could have chosen to emphasize worship or praise or petition. But after teaching the Lord's Prayer, Jesus only singled out one element, forgiveness. He knew this was the hard part of that prayer. 
So Jesus emphasized from verse 14, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus basically gave a stern warning. Forgiveness or lack of it has eternal consequences. Our Heavenly Father will forgive you to the extent you forgive others. Now, that's serious. I take Jesus seriously. In plain language, he's saying you can risk going to hell simply because there is someone you have refused not to forgive. But right in this life, when you do not forgive, you are not able to move forward. It's like that person is holding you back, back to your past. You are unable to make progress. Question two. How do I forgive someone who is not sorry? This is a serious question. I need you to understand forgiveness has nothing to do with the other person. Forgiveness is an attitude of the heart. So forgiveness is not a factor of whether someone said sorry or not. Don't wait for anybody's apology for you to let go resentment and bitterness and anger. I'll never forget, one day we took one of our cars for where I live. They require vehicles to go through emission tests. Otherwise, they don't renew the license. I don't know about where you live. So we had a car that didn't pass the emission test. We went to a garage. My master died. And when we went there, there was this guy who did diagnosis. And then he told me what he's going to repair, a couple of things. And then he told me that the bill is going to be 6,000 bucks. I didn't believe him. The car was operating normally. So I actually told him as much. I doubt your diagnosis. He got so upset, he banged the table, he called me all the names you know in America. I looked at him, I didn't answer back. When he was done with the yelling, I told him, I am so sorry. I don't understand about vehicles, and that was insensitive of me. He got embarrassed. He started apologizing to me, but I still didn't change my mind. I took the car to another garage, and the guy actually charged me 500 bucks, and the car passed the emission. Have you ever gone somewhere, you're not an expert, but you sense you're being conned? That's the kind of a feeling I had. But I have seen situations like that, and people end up fighting, and others end up shooting each other because someone yelled, and another one reacted, and yelled back, and yelled back. 37% of murder victims in America is domestic violence, and the victim did not have any record. He just, he, she acted in anger, and they pulled the trigger, killed someone they loved, simply because they reacted. They took a step in anger. It is your responsibility as a child of God never to allow anger to be stored up. When you stuff up emotions, eventually they destroy you. Migraines, heartaches, headaches, back pains, ulcers, depression, and even suicidal thoughts, simply because someone offended you. They have since moved on, but you are still 20 years ago. You are still holding on to your past. So I want to suggest three things. Number one, pray for them. When you pray for someone who offended you, you start sending positive vibes to them because we are spiritual beings living in this body. Number two, bless them. Wish them well. Speak well of them. And number three, do them good. If you are supposed to support them, support them as though they did not offend you. Support them the way you used to do before the time they offended you. Now, my dad and I couldn't talk for many years. 
I had a lot of resentment and bitterness and anger in my heart. Anger reserves. My father never paid my college school fees or my sister's college school fees. And he abused my mom verbally, emotionally, physically several times, even in our presence. And I didn't realize how much bitterness was in me. Every conversation with my dad, something would go wrong. I don't know whether you have ever been in such a relationship. Every small issue is blown out of proportion. Every molehill grows up into a mountain in milliseconds. It is because of historical baggage. And at some point, I decided to withdraw from him to protect my heart from hurting. Days turned into weeks, into months, into years. And one day, I called a couple of friends. I had the Holy Spirit speak to me. I was in a church like you're seated. I was not the guest speaker. Someone was preaching. In fact, he was not preaching about forgiveness. He was speaking about personalities. But the Holy Spirit spoke to me. And I told Marcy, I want us to go and visit my dad. I called many of my friends. We went, several of us, many vehicles. We did shopping that lasted him for two years. And then I told one of my friends, I want you to be my spokesman. I won't talk. Speak on my behalf and tell my father sorry. Zero conditions. Just tell him I'm sorry for everything. Don't revisit any issue. Don't revisit any history. To the best of my knowledge, I couldn't tell what I have done to him, but I said I'm the one who's going to say sorry. I, I, I'm going to be, you know, the moment you reach out, you're the bigger one because forgiveness is a virtue for the brave. Forgiveness is not for the weak. Forgiveness is for the humble and the brave. And I decided to reach out to my dad. Now, this is not my formula, the one I'm giving you right now. This formula was given by Jesus Christ. Jesus said, in Matthew 5, 43 to 45, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Let's face it. In our day-to-day -day living, the people we hate are former friends. It's an ex, it's a parent, it's a sibling, it's a neighbor, it's a work colleague, it's a boss. Very few of us here hate Vladimir Putin so much. Most of us, the guys we hate, are people we have related with. Does that make sense? They are former friends or relatives, especially relatives. And Jesus is saying this is the natural order of things. Hate those dudes. He said, uh, 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 uh. look at verse 44. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Did the mother curse you? Did the father curse you when you were growing up? Did the grandmother curse you when you were a child? Jesus is saying, hey, bless her. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Continue supporting that child despite the fact that somebody hates you because it's the right thing to do, even though you're not talking with your mother, your sister, or your sister-in-law. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. There are people who don't love you. They love your bank account. They just love the fact that you send them money. They are spitefully using you and you know it. And Jesus is saying, pray for them. You diffuse the negative energy. Verse 45. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. Like father, like son. Your heavenly father sets rain and sun to the good and the wicked. You want to be a son of your father? Then you've got to bless those who curse you. Do good to those who are doing bad to you. This is the kingdom principle. This does not work in this material world. But a transformed life, a life that is Christ-like, can follow this formula. Because by doing so, you will be known to be the sons of God. Earlier in this sermon, in the beatitude, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Only a son of God can go the extra mile to cause peace, even when they are offended. Question three, how many times 
should I forgive? One of the things I admire about Simon Peter is how he was a realist. So when Jesus emphasized forgiveness so much, Peter said, hey, Lord, let's get real because I want to make it to heaven. I want to know. Give me a figure. Give me numbers. Peter asked Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, give me numbers. I want to be sure. If I'm done with seven, then I kill them. Give me figures. Verse 22, Matthew 18, Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Jesus was saying this because he knew seven times in marriage, guys will kill each other. So let's increase the number. 490 times. But was Jesus really talking about 490 times? No. He was saying forgiveness is a lifetime attitude. It's a lasting attitude. It's a constant attitude. It's a decision you make. It's not an emotion. It's not about the heat of the emotion. It's a decision you make deep down your heart. I am not going to carry any more baggage. I am not going to carry any more bitterness and anger and resentment. I choose not to take offense. I choose not to begrudge anyone, not to store up grudges. Now, this conversation between Jesus and Peter took an interesting turn. Jesus gave a story. There was this CEO who had very many workers. And there was an employee who owed him 10,000 bucks. And he decided to jail him. But the guy went on his knees, begged for mercies, begged for forgiveness. And the master said, all right, I write it off. I forgive you the entire debt, 10,000 bucks. But then the guy went and took one of his fellow employees to jail because of 100 bucks. And the other colleague employees were so upset, so angry, they went to the boss and said, look, you forgive this guy 10,000 bucks, but he has put our colleague in jail because of 100 bucks. Is this fair? The master became so upset, and he told this guy, I forgave you 10,000. You couldn't extend grace to someone else for 100 bucks. Get into jail until you clear my entire debt. And then Jesus concluded the story by saying, Matthew 18, 35, So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Jesus said, I will not take lip service. You must forgive from your heart. And if you don't forgive your brother the small debt, I will not forgive you the big debt I have forgiven you. What was Jesus saying? Guys, if I expose your sins, your marriages will collapse, your businesses will collapse, the taxman will come for you and put you in jail. I have forgiven you much more. Many of you will remember certain gentlemen who caught a woman in the very act of adultery and brought her to Jesus and said, according to our law, she ought to die. And Jesus shifted their focus from the woman's sins to their own sins. And he dared them. Any of you without sin, pick the first rock and kill her. And they knew this is the Messiah. They were just pretending. They knew he's going to lift down their sins one by one. And because these were Pharisees, who were regarded by people as righteous, they immediately knew they will be embarrassed. And when Jesus exposes their sins, they will not be able to preach anymore. So they all left one by one. I dare say today, it's hypocrisy that makes us not to forgive others their sins. We like exposing the sins of others, but our own sins to be forgiven. Why? Because of our hypocrisy. So the truth is, if you keep hypocrisy aside, you will be able to forgive others. Because the question is, why do you want to be forgiven and you do not want to forgive? Question four, how do I know I have forgiven? Because all of you have been offended by someone. 
How do you know that for sure I have forgiven someone? Answer, your words. If you open your mouth and you're always speaking how this person offended you, how they cheated on you, how they misused you, how they fired you, how this boss was unfair with you, how your brother took advantage of your childhood, how this cop pulled you over unfairly. If you open your mouth and keep speaking about how this person used to abuse you emotionally, verbally, how they took advantage of you, how they were malicious, if you are opening your mouth to say how these people did to you, you have never, ever forgiven them. Because it doesn't matter how bad someone may be, there is something good about them. So you know you have forgiven them when you're able to speak good about them and to wish them all. Well, for example, a parent may have a bad on you. That's a terrible thing. But there is something good with them. They didn't kill you. There is something good in every person. They could have killed you as an infant or aborted you or thrown you, you know. Immediately you are born. There is something good about them. It can't be all bad. Your ex can't be all bad. If they were all bad, how did you marry them? There must be something good about that person. Your boss can't be all bad. If he was all bad, how was he hired? How was he promoted in the corporate ranks? There is no way that guy could have become a boss if he was all bad. There is something good in every person. If you find yourself speaking about their good, wishing them well, then you know you have recovered. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 12, 34. And Jesus was building a case. He said a tree is known by its fruit. So we get to know someone when they speak. When you speak, we get to know who you are and what you're going through. Your tongue reveals your heart. So you know you have forgiven someone when you're able to speak well of them, wish them well, and bless them. Question five and the last one. Must I reconcile when I forgive? No, you don't have to. Forgiveness is a one-way traffic. Reconciliation is a two-way traffic. The deal is this. You can forgive someone, but they have not necessarily forgiven you. You can forgive someone, but they are not ready yet to reconcile with you. Does that make sense? And I'll give you one or, one or two practical examples. Let's talk about one of the areas where people hurt each other the most. Relationships. That's the area we hurt each other the most. So if someone cheats on you, this is a deal breaker. By law and by scriptures. Jesus said in Matthew 5.32, adultery is one ground for divorce. Now you have a choice to make. You can choose to forgive them and reconcile. Or you can choose to forgive them and part ways. Now, reconciling or releasing them is your legal right and also biblical right. The choice is in your hands. For me, the way I look at it, because I speak on this subject from time to time and people write to me from all over the world. If somebody cheats on my face and they want me to know, then I don't think they are cheating on me. When you are cheating, you are hiding. So if you're doing it on my face, I think it's insult, it's abuse, it's arrogance. You despise me. You must be a narcissist to cheat on the face of your partner. Such a person, I would release them immediately, but I still forgive them. Remember, forgiveness is letting go resentment and bitterness. That means we can still meet at the shopping mall by coincidence, and greet each other and ask them, how have you been for the last two years? So I can still release them from my heart and release them from my life. Forgiveness is not synonymous to reconciliation because reconciliation takes two. It takes the two parties to be in agreement. For example, at the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Luke 23, 34. You know Jesus sincerely forgave them because 
Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. These guys crushed his head. They bruised him with metallic cords, beyond recognition. The little energy and breath he had, he said, forgive them. He could have poured out bitterness. He could have caught fire from heaven as Elisha did to the 42 boys. But Jesus poured what was in him because the only thing that was in the heart of Jesus was forgiveness and reconciliation. That was the only thing that could ooze out of his heart. However, he did not reconcile with them. And that's the point I want you to see. Even after the cross, after resurrection, Jesus never went back to the chief priests and the pilots and the Roman soldiers who pierced him to reconcile with them. He never appeared to them again. On the contrary, for 40 days, he appeared to his disciples. He appeared to his loved ones, but he never went back to his killers. He forgave them, but they did not reconcile. Why? Even though Jesus was ready to forgive them, they were not ready for forgiveness. And they were not ready for reconciliation. Am I communicating? So reconciliation has to be a two-way traffic, but forgiveness is a one-way traffic. It is your personal choice and has nothing to do with anybody's behavior. I spoke on forgiveness one year ago. I took a different direction, but I want to encourage you to look for that message. It will still bless your heart, and perhaps you can share it with those you care about. It's available in my YouTube channel. I close with the words of Suzanne Somers. Forgiveness is a gift you give yourself. Were you blessed by this message? Are you blessed by my ministry? I would like to invite you to be my ministry partner by sending me your love offering every month. I've shared with you the giving options on the screen. Help me to spread the gospel around the world. And remember to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to hit the bell to get notified whenever I upload new videos. And if you're visiting the Atlanta Metropolis or you live around Atlanta area, welcome to Family Church, 287 Mount Calvary Road, Marietta, Georgia.